Glad you guys are here. Welcome to Church of the Crossroads. My name is John Parkey. I'm the lead pastor here, and we're so glad you're here. Merry Christmas and all that good stuff. Uh, welcome to our family service. So, you know, let me just give you a little bit of permission. Uh, kids, feel free to color while I preach. <laughs> Babies, feel free to cry. You know, don't worry about distractions. I'm, I'm okay with distractions. I work well under stress and chaos, so don't feel like you're bothering me. You may be bothering the people around you, but you're not bothering me, all right? So babies, feel free to cry. Mamas, feel free to stay in here while they cry. It's okay. It's one of those days. It's our family service. Um, anyway, uh, speaking of babies, um, I love babies. I, I don't know why, uh, but, I, but I always have. Like, you have a baby. Uh, I want to hold it. I'm just, I'm just, that's just me. Uh, I, I know a guy, uh, I just he talked to him last week, and he said that he and his wife, she's getting ready to have their first baby, and he is scared to death. He's never really held a baby, and he thinks he's going to break it when it gets here. Like, he's not sure what he's going to do and how he's going to hold it. That, that's never been me. That's, I've never really had that problem. I'm not, I'm not sure what his fear is because I've never, I've never felt that way. Um, there's pro- and it's probably a good thing that I'm like a baby guy because... Um, Church of the Crossroads has a lot of babies. I mean, a lot. Like in the last 15 months, we've had over 20 babies born here at Church of the Crossroads. That's crazy. Uh, matter of fact, I was, I was thinking through that this week, and I kind of I did the statistics. Like I thought, you know, we're growing in number on Sunday mornings. We're outgrowing the gym. And, and because it's, it's because we've got a lot of first-time guests and it's really because you're having babies. That's why we're growing, right? Like some of you walked in here and uh, you took up a whole roll, just you and all your babies. Like some of you just keep having them too. Like there are a lot of babies at, at Church of the Crossroads. And, and to you guys, to you ladies, you keep having them. I'm just like, good work. Keep up the good work. You know what I mean? Like that's just, just kind of where I'm at. But babies, I love them. And there are two babies in particular that changed my life. My two babies. And they're not babies anymore. My daughter's 20, my son's 17, soon to be 18. But when they were born, I'm, I'm, I'm not just saying this, they changed my life. Like back in 1998, Christmas, December 1998, my, my wife was in her last month of pregnancy, like her last trimester, and like she, she, she uh, uh, the baby bump was no longer a baby bump. It was like an all-out baby mountain. You know what I mean? Like it was like she was huge and she was waddling and she was cute and she had the baby glow going, right? Um, it, was, it was a beautiful thing. But, but New Year's Eve, uh, so that Christmas was pretty cool. 1998, uh, our first baby was on the way and very close. And on New Year's Eve, my baby uh, daughter was born. New Year's Eve. Like I still call her my little tax exemption. But, but, but 10 pounds, right? She was born 10 pounds. And, and all, all day long at the hospital, after she was born, you know, she was born 10 pounds, I was like, yes. I kept going, like as babies were born at the hospital, I kept like walking down to the nursery just to make sure she was the biggest of the day, you know, like at the end of the day, I was like, yes, I had the biggest kid. Anyway, my, but my little tax exemption was born 10 pounds um, and, and looked like a sumo wrestler, fat little cheeks. That baby changed my life, like made me grow up. Like, it was at that point when I first held her that I realized how much I was going to be willing to give up and how much I was going to be willing to sacrifice. And it was even in that moment when I held her that I realized I would die for someone. I would die for her. Like, like her presence, her birth caused me to, to reevaluate my whole existence. Like that baby created a crisis in me, right? She, she, she created this turmoil in me, a good kind of turmoil, a good kind of crisis, because she, her birth, caused me to ask myself, what kind of dad am I going to be? What kind of man will I be? Like that baby caused an internal good uh, tension inside of me, a good, a good wrestling. But let me read you the story of the baby that we're here to celebrate. In Matthew chapter 1, the story goes like this. You've heard this. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother, Mary, was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public, public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, 
Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from sin. And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. So when Joseph woke up, he, had, he did what the angel of the Lord had, had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife, but he did not consummate their marriage um, until after, after she gave birth uh, to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Now, Fast forward, not fast forward, but in the Bible, fast forward to Luke. Here's kind of the rest of the story. Luke chapter 2 says, In those days Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth, Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. So he went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him, and she was expecting a child. While they were there, the, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good, no good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find the baby wrapped in claws and lying in a manger. What a story. Beautiful, humble, powerful, meaningful, priceless, and most importantly, listen, it's true. A virgin gives birth to a child who is going to save us. We're ending our series today called Hijacking Your Christmas like Christmas is supposed to be um, a celebration of this simple yet miraculous thing, the birth of Jesus. Yet we've kind of been talking about this all month, yet in preparation for this day where we celebrate Jesus' birth, we hustle, right? I mean, we hustle. And, and we prepare and we plan and we shop and we cook and we travel and we give gifts. And, and there's a lot of pressure heading into um, Christmas Day. There's a lot of pressure to perform at Christmas. Would you agree? Like even on the day when we exchange gifts, on Christmas morning, there's a lot of pressure um, wondering, did we give the right gifts? Did they like the gifts that we gave? Did we spend enough? Were we fair in the gifts that we gave? Is cash okay? Is a gift card okay? There's a lot of pressure to perform around Christmas. And add to that just like life's regular junk that isn't working in our favor at this time, like the loss of a loved one, right? On top of all that other pressure, add getting the flu. Anybody, anybody know anybody that's got the flu right now? I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy. Add to that financial pressure. Add to that uh, health issues. Add to that relational conflict with family that you're going to have to go visit here in just a couple days. That crazy uncle, that unpredictable crazy uncle that we all have, you're going to have to go visit him, right? Like, like, and, and so it's easy with all of that to have your Christmas hijacked and miss the point. Here's, and here's what we've said to this point this month. You and I, we can't change our circumstances. Like, life happens to all of us. The flu happens to a lot of us at the most inconvenient times. We can't change our circumstances, but what we can change is how we approach life and where we find our hope, our joy, and our peace. Like, we can't, we can't keep bad things from happening to make the world work in our favor all the time, but we can become the kind of people who remain at peace in times of trouble, who find hope in the storm, who still hold um, on to joy even while sad and mourning. If Jesus is who we look to for that kind of hope, joy, and peace, the kind that doesn't get hijacked even when the world is in chaos. So I'm calling today's sermon Hijacking Life. We've talked about hope, joy, and peace. Today I want to talk about life 
and where hope, joy, and peace encompass parts of our lives, I wanted to end this series talking about the entirety of our life, the overall picture of our life, because here's the reality of many of our lives. Many people just exist. You know what I mean? Ever feel that way? I've gone through seasons where I felt like I was just existing. Like many people just exist and live lives of drudgery, monotony, boredom, and routine. Others have committed their lives to, 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 to moving fast and to chasing after things that in the end will discourage and disappoint. Like I'm going to have as much fun and I'm going to play as much as possible. I'm going to relax and enjoy as much as possible. I'm going to make as much money as possible. I'm going to travel the world as much as possible. I'm going to give my kids as much as possible. Like most people somewhere in their late teens, early 20s, find that one thing, value that one thing above all other things, and they get after it. And here's, what I, here's, here's kind of the scenario I want to paint for you this morning. What if you are after that one thing, money, possessions, <laughs> success, uh, stat, wh whatever it is, what if you're after that one thing and it's important to you and it's the most important thing to you at 20, you chase after it all of your life, but at 60 or 65, you look back at your life and go, Wow, that's not that important. I made something important that really shouldn't have been. Like, what if you get to 60, 65, you spent your entire life chasing that thing, something that in the end was worthless. How would you feel about your life? Would you feel robbed? Would you feel like you wasted your life? I would. I would. Uh, and I would be mad about it, too. Like, I would be sad that I wasted my life, but I would be mad that there were people in my life who didn't try to change my direction, who didn't try to show me that what I was chasing after was worthless. Or I'd be mad at the people who taught me that this was the most important thing. I'd be sad and I'd be mad. And for some people, that's exactly what's happening. Maybe it is for even some of you here in this room, like you're wondering why you're not happy, why you can't settle down, why you feel discontent even though you're doing all the right things. And it might be that the reason you're not is that you're chasing after and valuing something that is actually robbing you. See, that's kind of what happens sometimes. Like sometimes... I, the, the things I think will add value to my life actually rob me of life. But, but we all, there is inside of us this innate desire, this, this we're born with this desire to find that one thing that changes everything. Like that's a natural born desire. We all have it. We all want that thing. We all want it. We just don't know what it is. Like we're searching for it but we don't know what it is. Jesus is born, and the Bible says he's it. He is what you're looking for. He's it. This humbled, swaddled, manger-laid baby is it. Like the baby we celebrate at Christmas, that baby, for me, has done what my kids when they were born did for me. Like this baby Jesus, when, as I got to know him, created, and I hope he'll do the same for you, has created this tension in my heart, this good, healthy tension in my heart. Like they, they call him Jesus, which is the Greek form of the name Joshua, which means the Lord saves. And then, and then it says that the people will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Like why is that important to know? Like what is... Jesus saving you from? What is Jesus saving? Here's what he's saving. He's saving your life. He's it. He's come to save your life. The God who created you has come to you to save you. So this baby is God pursuing you. This baby is God saying, you're worth it. Like he's saying, this baby, my, my own only son, you are just as important to me as him. That's why I'm sending him to sacrifice for you. You're valuable to him in this way. That's the message of Christmas. You are valuable to God. The question is, is he valuable to you? Jesus grows up, right? He, he, he grows up. He crawls out of the nativity. He grows in wisdom and stature, the Bible tells us, and he becomes a young man. Around the 30, he begins to preach and begins to teach, and as he does, he says things like this. 
In Luke 19, 19, 10, he says, For I have come, for the Son of Man has come to seek and save the lost. It, Paul says in 2 Corinthians that Jesus died so that you might live. John eleven twenty five, 25, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. So Jesus comes to give you life, to save your life and to give, your, give you life. Now you may say, well, I have life, like I'm breathing. Like I got up this morning, uh, then I had my first cup of coffee, and then I really came to life. Like I'm alive. And, and for you, that's true. Like, like you are alive. You're here because you're alive. You're living and you're breathing. You have life. So he must not be talking about just living and breathing. When Jesus says, I've come to give you life, he must not be just, just be talking about living and breathing. There must be something more. And in one of his most pro- powerful and profound statements, Jesus says this, John 10.10. 10. He says, the thief comes to steal, only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have, but I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. And some other trans- translation says, um, I- I've come to give them life and give it to them more abundantly. I've come to give them abundant life. What does that mean? What does life to the full look like? Like To me, that sounds healthy. That sounds good. That sounds right. That sounds like something I want. I want to experience abundant life. I want to experience full life. So what's that look like? And Jesus is saying there is a life beyond just living and breathing. There is a life that is abounding and abundant and and sturdy that can only be found in me. And so when he says that, he's also saying that any other life that's not found in me is a life that is being robbed, is a life that's being sold short, is a life that's being hijacked. Outside of me, the things you're chasing after will hijack your entire life and will even lead to, they'll disappoint you, and they will even lead to death. They will let you down, and they will destroy you. This is, this is what Jesus is saying. And so Jesus is saying, if you will find life in me, you will find life more abundantly. And so when he says life more abundantly or life to the full, what does he mean? The first thing that Jesus means when he says abundant life, he's talking about, a, first of all, a life that never ends. Like, I've come to give you life abundantly, life abundantly even after this life. Like, eternal life. Like, you will live forever in me and only through me. So he's talking about just outside of, outside of this life, um, there's life to come. There's more life to come. And so in Jesus, we find life. Outside of Jesus, we're just the walking dead. That's just, this is kind of the sentiment of Jesus. This is what he says in Scripture. The second thing Jesus means when he says abundant life or life to the full, and this is what I really want to get at this morning for the next couple minutes, is, and this is, what, this is how this whole series gets summed up, is this. Jesus offers you, while still here on this earth, a super abundance of life. Not later, we're not waiting on it. He offers it to us now. Like my life, if I live it for me and and rely on me and my circumstances to go my way, my life gets easily hijacked. I sell myself short. In other words, I will never find life in my performance on this earth. I won't find life in my possessions or my pursuits or my position in society. All of these things will leave my life empty, and and to rely on them will lead me, will let me down, will lead me to death. So I'll rob myself of the super abundance that Jesus is promising outside of him. Like, think about it like this. Let's say you're going on a trip, and so you uh, reserve a rental car, a subcompact, cheap rental car, and you get there, and really what you want is a Prius, right? Which I say Prius because my wife and I rented a car a couple years ago, and, and a compact car, and they gave us a Prius. And I, we still, it was the worst car ever. I'm sorry, if you have Prius, I'm sorry. But it, I never knew if it was on. And um, it goes like zero to 60 in like 45 seconds. That's, 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 it, was, it, was, it was not good. Anyway, so, so you, you're expecting a Prius, right? And so you get to the rental car company, you're ready for your trip, and you get there and he says, we don't have your car. Matter of fact, we don't have any compact cars available, economy cars available. Um, So we're going to upgrade you at no additional expense to a Cadillac Escalade. Would you upgrade? 
would you upgrade? I, I would. I would. Not because I want a Cadillac es Escalade, but for a week, that'd be great, right? Other than a Prius? Absolutely. Right? Like, will a Cadillac Escalade get you where you're going better or faster than a Prius? Maybe a little bit faster, but in the end, a lot faster than the Prius? No. But will it make you ride in style and comfort? And will, will, will you sit up and feel better about yourself while riding on the road? Probably. So would you upgrade from a Prius for a week to a Cadillac Escalade? I would. Right, let me give you another scenario. Let's say um, you're going on a trip and instead of renting a car, you're going to fly. So you get to the airport and you've purchased economy class tickets to fly on vacation. You get on the plane and the flight attendant says to you and your wife, we just like the way you look. So we would like to upgrade you to first class. Do you and your wife take the upgrade? Absolutely, right? Because bigger seats, right? There's just two seats in a row. You don't have to sit in the middle with some, some big guy falling asleep and leaning on you and snoring in your ear, right? Like you, there, there's free food and beverages. There's, there's no strange people sitting around you who won't stop talking. Like you would upgrade. I'll take it. We would upgrade, I think. This is why Jesus was born. To, he came to this earth to give us life, not just to give us life like everybody else, but to upgrade our lives. Jesus came to offer us not just a good life, but a better life. Not just a, a full life, but one much fuller. And anything other than what Jesus offers is a life that's hijacked. A life that's robbed of better and fuller. And I'm not talking Escalades and first class flights. Like, <clears throat> these gifts right here. These, these Christmas gifts. These represent the life that most people live. Like, these represent your income and your success and your status. These represent um, your... your uh, uh, your prestige in society, these represent uh, the things that you're pursuing, and, and they're not bad things. And this, is, and, and this is a pretty good life, but most people, where are my helpers at? Most people, come on up, most people settle for this life. And in and, the and, end, and most of us can have a pretty good life, but Jesus says, I've come not to just give you a pretty good life. If you settle for this, you're getting robbed and you're going to miss out on this. Jesus says, I've come to fill your life full. I've come to give you abundant life. And not, not bigger homes and bigger cars, but, but things like, uh, like, like this. Like this is confidence that when you die... You are eternally secure and get to live with the Father in heaven. Like this right here is um, Jesus living inside of you through the Holy Spirit. Like this, like there's a lot of, uh, uh, like this is peace and this is hope and this is joy and this is, you know, I mean, there's a lot of grace in here. There's a lot of grace in here and there's a lot of forgiveness, a lot of forgiveness. This is, this is uh, uh, let's call this um, uh, uh, confidence in the fact that um, God is with you and Jesus is for you. Let, let's call it that. Like there's, this is the abundant life that, that Jesus is offering. Grace and mercy is full of grace and mercy. This, this is maybe like sturdiness. Like you're sturdy because the God of the universe is with you and loves you and sent his sons to, to die for you. Like this isn't things. This is a state of being. This is a place that Jesus brings you. These are the promises that he offers you. He says one of the promises he makes in scripture is to give you a hope and a future. This is the hope and a future. Like this is the abundant life. This is just part of it too. What about over here? Look at this right here. Like we settle for this little life not realizing that Jesus is offering us all of this. Like, how about this? This is purpose. This is purpose. In Christ, your life, your purpose in life changes. What you pursue in life changes. What about this right here? This is maybe um, victory, 
right? Victory. This is, there's a lot of victory in here too because Jesus has won the victory for us. There's a, there's a lot of winning with Jesus. Here's strength and courage. Here's uh, uh, identity in Christ. Here's, va- here's, your va- here's your value and worth right here. Like, like how, ma- how many of us are living our lives, sorry, how many of us are living our lives trying to be loved, trying to find love, and we're desperate, and our entire life is like in a panic trying to prove that we are lovable in order to find a few people who will love us. In Christ, you are loved. The fact that he died for you, you are loved. You are lovable. You are worth it. And so you can walk tall, and you can be sturdy because you don't need, the, you don't, you don't need to please everybody else. You've pleased the one. You're worth it to him. He loves you. And so you can walk tall and strong and with, with, because of that, like, like strength and courage. And you know what? There's a lot of grace and forgiveness in here too. A lot of grace and a lot of mercy. What do you want to call that? What do you want to call that? Purpose? There's purpose. Like there's just a lot, like, like freedom. There's a lot of freedom in here too. And Jesus is saying, look, you've settled for, you've settled for these things right here. And this is not a bad life. Like, like most people in America are living this life and it's not bad. It's kind of good. And you could ride out this life and feel decent about yourself and look back and go, you know what? I I succeeded in a lot of ways and, and I had a lot of fun and I played a lot. My family was healthy and I really, but in the end, this will not save you. In the end, it is a life that gets high, that it, in the end is hijacked because it can't save you. And Jesus is saying, I've come to save you. I've come to be with you. I've come to change your outlook on life and your purpose. I've come to give you abundant life. This is yours. This is what he's saying. This could be yours if you'll just subscribe to me, follow me, and let me love you and walk through this life with you. That's life. That's life in Christ. Tear them down if you want. I don't care. (laughs) Boom. You want to tear those down? The overflow of abundant life falling on this crowd right here. Don't open them yet, though, because I got a surprise for that. Do not open that right now. You can open it in a minute. Get out of here. (laughs) Hey, I will let you open that one in a minute. I promise if you don't open it now. Go sit down. You can have that one. Because there is something in that. Well, leave it here. Where are you going to put it? You guys can go sit down. Thank you. Thank our helpers, will you? You can't get out of the pile of abundant life. Because God is with us, because Jesus saves us, there is no life like life in Christ. The one born in a manger, born into chaos. He he was born into chaos. He died in chaos, and he rose from the grave in chaos. And he gives us the kind of life that rises above the chaos. He doesn't change the chaos in our lives, but he helps us manage it and live through it in a different way. That baby changes everything. Like, this is an upgrade. This is a promise. This baby will grow up to offer a life that can't be taken. It can't be lost. It can't be hijacked. This is abundant life in Christ. Let's pray.